Good evening and welcome to this Reformation lecture for 2023. It is my great privilege to welcome you to Concordia University's Vern Gunderman Reformation Lecture Series featuring Reverend Dr. Peter Nafsker from Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. We look forward to a wonderful evening together and his presentation, The Communal Shape of the Christian Life, Then and Now. Concordia inaugurated the Reformation Lecture in 2012 to highlight the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation in 2017. The purpose of this annual lecture is to inform the CSP community and area congregations about the life, thought, and influence of Martin Luther, and to encourage Lutherans and other Christians to recognize the value of studying our heritage in order to apply the lessons of history to the present and future life of the church. At Concordia University, we are committed to not only prepare students for the workplace, but to form students and to create opportunities like this for all of us in the wider campus community and in the church to lead lives of meaning, integrity, and purpose. In Christ, we have the opportunity to live lives of wholeness, of being in community together at the university and beyond. Tonight's Reformation lecture will encourage us to think more deeply about community and life together, which has implications for us here as students and as faculty and staff, and also for all of us in our own congregations who are gathered here this evening. I'm just so very pleased to see a, such a nice mix of students and members from congregations and from the local community uh, gathered tonight. It's really extraordinary for us to be able to pull together on a Thursday evening for a lecture like this. The lecture series is made possible through generous gifts to Concordia in memory of Reverend Vern Gunderman, a 1957 graduate of this institution, a pastor and leader in the LCMS for over 40 years, and recipient of Concordia's Distinguished Alumni Award. Vern's son, Pastor Tom Gunderman, is our campus pastor. So please join me in thanking the Gunderman family for their support of tonight's lecture. So here's the plan for the evening. Dr. Nafsker will give his presentation in just a few moments. And then afterward, he will take some questions from all of you in the audience. And so students, please save your best and your hardest questions for Dr. Nafsker. We will then have a reception right out here in the lobby where you'll have another opportunity to visit with Dr. Nafsker and also with each other. To begin this evening of fellowship and learning together, I've invited Professor Shelley Schwalm to open us with prayer and to introduce our speaker. Professor Schwalm has been a longtime member of the campus community as a student at CSP and in multiple roles in church relations and in CSP ministry. Last year, she began as a faculty member in the Department of Theology and Ministry as the director of the DCE program. Professor Schwalm is a tremendous gift and blessing to our institution, a phenomenal mentor and professor to our students and a dear colleague she also has worked closely with Dr. Nafsker in their joint work with the LCMS Youth Gathering on the Theological Planning Team. Please welcome Professor Shelley Schwalm. Good evening. It is an honor and a joy to introduce Reverend Dr. Peter Nafsker uh, to share with us for this year's Reformation Lecture. I had known of Peter while he was a pastor in Hugo. Some of you here know where that is this evening. Uh, and serving as an adjunct professor here at CSP. But the first conversation I had with Peter was when he called me one day to see if I would be a part of the Bible study team for the 2019 LCMS Youth Gathering. So every three years, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod hosts a gathering of over 20,000 high schoolers. And for many of those gatherings, Peter has shaped the theological development and steered the teams of people who would develop the Bible studies and share them with thousands of youth. I clearly remember this phone call including three criteria to be part of this team. First, to be solid theologically in your teaching of the scriptures. Second, to be able to engage and communicate well with teenagers. Okay. And third, 
you must play well with others. These were non-negotiable. Our first meeting, uh, the team did introductions, and then Peter said, okay team, we have a lot to do this week, and your first task is relationship. Because it's going to be difficult to accomplish anything else if you don't trust each other. That was accurate for a room of people with enough words and thoughts to meet his first two criteria. Uh, he encouraged us, a group of about 15, barely more than strangers at that point, to share prayer requests and life updates and to lean into this community. I've been on a couple of gathering teams formed like this, and I can say that some now, now some of my dearest friends have come through these communities that Peter has shaped in this way. Uh, Peter has undoubtedly made me a better teacher of the Bible, and I have learned even more from him about humility and steadiness and patience and leadership. That collaboration over competition is possible among church workers, and our church, wor and our church is better for it, and you might even make some friends along the way. Peter does a lot more than write theological papers for youth gatherings. He is a husband to Katie and a dad to four awesome kids. He serves as associate professor of practical theology and director of student life at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where he has been a faculty member since 2016. And his areas of interest and expertise include theology of scripture, of preaching, ecclesiology, the Lutheran confessions, confirmation and Christian formation. And he also coaches the basketball team. Uh, Peter works hard to shape good preaching of the good news in our church body by grading stacks of sermons. Thank you for your service. And while he certainly brings clarity and accessibility of the good news of Jesus in his teaching and preaching, it is embodied in the hospitality of the Nafsker patio and living room. And I am so grateful that classes of seminary students and families are better equipped to live in and extend the community of Christ in their lives and their ministries because you and Katie have extended this gift of community to them and showed them the health and goodness of walking together. So we are so excited to hear from you. With that, let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a gift that community is in your very nature, Holy Trinity. We thank you for the opportunity to catch small, a small glimpse of what it means to be part of the body of Christ tonight as we gather in this room. And as Jesus prayed before going to the cross that believers would be one as you are one, Holy Trinity, we pray that tonight. As we consider that walking with you has never meant walking alone, open our hearts and minds to learning from Doc, Dr. Nafsker tonight and what it looks like to walk together in the church and for the sake of the gospel in the world. God bless and guide Peter's words that we may be reaffirmed that your first and primary task with us has always been relationship. Reconciled to you and to each other by the blood of Jesus, and it's in that name that we pray. Amen. Introducing Peter Nafsker. That was way too nice, Shelley. Um, I will affirm, though, what you said about my wife. Uh, uh, Katie could not be here tonight. She really wanted to. I was reminded when we landed uh, in, uh, when I landed in the airport, how much I love and how much we miss Minnesota. Uh, we've been gone now for seven and a half years, and uh, I do wonder sometimes why we left. Um, and then I saw some of the members of New Life here, and I thought, oh, that's why we left. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not looking at you, Pastor John. Um, no, uh, it's, uh, thank you for your uh, kind words, Shelley, and uh, it, it was really a joy to be here. Thank you, uh, Mark and, and President Friedrich. Uh, Christy, wherever you are, thank you for your help. Um, greetings to all of you on behalf of Concordia Seminary uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, it's a joy to get out of St. Louis <laughs> uh, sometimes and to get out into the church and to see real people, normal people, uh, the people of God. Uh, that really is a joy. Uh, this evening, I want to uh, talk with you about uh, the Christian life. Um, the, the church I served 
for nine years right out of seminary is called New Life. I think it's still called New Life uh, up in Hugo. And I, I loved the name of our church because in Christ there is new life always, new life every day, new life forgiven, renewed. Um, I, uh, Jesus' words in John 10, um, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Uh, so new life was, was very, uh, very much a special place for me. It's where I learned how to be a pastor how I learned how to love people that you never met uh, until you get to their church, and how to grow as a family. Um, New Life was a very special place for me. Um, So I want to think about the Christian life uh, then and now. Then is not my time in Minnesota. Uh, Then, of course, is the Reformation. And uh, I specifically want to talk about the communal shape of the Christian life then and now. Because I, I've sensed, uh, Shelley said I, I teach preaching. I teach, I grade a lot of sermons. Um, last time I counted it, I think it was 1,600 I've done in seven years. Um, I, I, we help students, I think, understand the gospel at the seminary. We really work hard at that. Um, and we also help them try to understand the wholeness of the Christian life. But I, I've noticed over seven years, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to break free of the shackles of an individualistic culture. Okay? And so one of the things I've found increasingly important to talk about and to think about is uh, the communal shape of the Christian life. How when we are brothers and sisters, when we're, when we're made uh, children of God, we are made siblings with one another. And so I thought maybe we would start tonight with a picture Uh, This is Martin Luther's table in Wittenberg. It's a carving of it, actually. Uh, I don't know if they have the original. But it's a carving in in the Luther House in Wittenberg. Uh, They've got a really really nice museum, and they have this picture of uh, the Luther home. And at Luther's home in Wittenberg in the early 1500s, they would usually have somewhere between 35 and 50 people at the dinner table. Okay? Uh, you had uh, Martin and Katie and their five children and Auntie Lena and six orphaned nieces and nephews, anywhere between, between 20 and 30 students who lived there with them, uh, 10 and 20 students. They had 10 servants there, uh, some maids, uh, Luther's secretary, Luther's assistant, Wolf, uh, the cook, Dorotheo, the coachman, and the swineherd. I don't know where the swineherd, swineherd sat at the table. Um, but at the very right side, the head of the table, that's where Luther would sit. And next to him, to his right, was Katie, his wife. And if you looked really closely, you'd see that it's almost every other one, man and woman, they were alternating. Uh, the kids were at the end of the table. Uh, and again, I don't know where the swineherd was. Um, but uh, that's, that's Luther's kitchen table. Now, I start with this picture because what I want to talk about today is not so much Luther's theory of church, his ecclesiology, his theological musings about what does it mean to be members of one another, 1 Corinthians 12 kind of thing. I'd really rather think about what it looks like and what it sounds like and what what life, the communal life, is actually like when it's lived uh, together. And so, and the reason I I really want to talk about this is I think this is missing in the church today. Not everywhere. Overstatements are for seminary professors. Um, (laughs) Not everywhere. But on the whole, I think we're missing this. I'll I'll come back to that in just a minute. So, there's Luther's table, but it wasn't just his table. This isn't a a description of Luther's household and that's it. Because you look at what Luther wrote, and sometimes we use the phrase hiding in plain sight. There's some things hiding in plain sight about the gospel that Luther taught and preached 
that, uh, that when you have eyes to see, you think, wow, that kind of stands out. It's pretty obvious. Uh, chief among these are the small catechism, right? Uh, we all could recite this probably if I covered the screen up. Um, notice what Luther says about community here. I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in the true faith. Comma. And I checked in the German. It's a comma there, too. Luther won't even finish his sentence until he says, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, makes the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus in the one common true faith daily in this Christian church. The Holy Spirit abundantly forgives all sins, mine and those of all believers. On the last day, the Spirit will raise me and all the dead and will give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. You notice Luther won't even finish his sentence when he's talking about individual faith, when he has to talk about the faith of all believers. Um, because in baptism, we're not just united with Christ, in his death and resurrection, but we are made members of one another. So Christian faith is never alone. It's, it's simply inconceivable to imagine the Christian life apart from that table, except that's kind of, that's kind of where things are, I think, for a lot of people. I'm, I'm just going to take for granted that you've all experienced being in a group and feeling very alone. Um, and I'm even going to be bold enough to say it might have even happened at church. Um, that's one of the hard things about leaving New Life, John, was that we went to the church so we didn't know anybody. You go from a church that's a healthy community, it's a family, and then you find yourself with people, yeah, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but you don't know them at all. And it can be really isolating. Um, so the table is kind of what I'm going to suggest we've lost. Or at least uh, we've, we've kind of neglected it or it's been diminished a little bit. Um, now, to help us understand what happened, and more importantly, to help us think about what should we do about this, uh, I'm going to turn to someone who was not Lutheran. Um, he was a Christian, um, a Protestant. He was a devout Huguenot, a French uh, uh, Christian. Um, I guess there aren't that many Lutherans in France, so I suppose we can forgive him. Um, but I'm thinking of the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. Uh, now, you didn't come here for philosophy, especially not on a Thursday night, but if you give me about three or four minutes with Ricoeur, I think it'll pay off, okay? So Ricoeur was a philosopher of language, and he thought about how language works, Specifically, how we interpret texts and what texts and words do to us. And he had kind of developed, he wrote an awful lot, but he developed what, uh, what he describes as, you, you could kind of describe as three worlds. Interpretation of any sort of text, and really in, in text here we could mean even just like a communicative event like we're talking right here, um, involves an interaction, and you might even say a movement between three worlds. Okay, the first world he calls a prefigured world. Okay, okay. Now I want you to just imagine before you, before you, you know, what's your favorite book you've read? Somebody, what's a favorite book you've read? Tom Sawyer. Before you read Tom Sawyer, um, you have no conception of Tom Sawyer on your radar, and then you have this prefigured world. It's the world as people experience it day in and day out before they read Tom Sawyer. That's the prefigured world. The configured world would be the world, well, now where you have to leave Tom Sawyer. Um, the world as it's portrayed in the Bible. It's not exactly Tom Sawyer. Mark Twain was good, but not that good. Um, so the prefigured world is kind of the world as we experience it day in, day out. The configured world is the world of the scriptures. Okay? So, for instance, in the configured world, that's the world we would say as Christians, this is the world the way it really is. Even though you don't see them, there are angels and demons. Even though you don't see the one you're talking to when Shelley prayed for us, we didn't see God the Father, but we believe he's there. 
uh, that he's listening. There's a world, the world as it really is, is a world where, well, in him we move and live and have our being. That's the configure of the world. The world as it really is. Okay. The third world is the refigured world, uh, Ricoeur said. The world as it could or it should be as God breaks into it and redeems it. Now, specifically thinking about the biblical world here, you get this prefigured world that is, well, for Christians, we know that this is actually a defigured world. That the world apart from God in Christ, the world, in whatever way it doesn't match up with the scriptures, is not just prefigured, but it's defigured. It's it's uh, distorted, it's corrupted, it's not the way it should be. Now, what I find helpful about Ricoeur is he helps us think about um, what happens when we engage the scriptures through a preacher, through evangelism, through a DCE, through... Um, education in the congregation through personal reading of the scriptures. We come to the scriptures with our prefigured world, the way it is, which is always going to be defigured in some sense because we're all broken and sinful. And then we engage the world as it really is in the scriptures, and that changes our whole world. It doesn't just uh, give us a boost. It doesn't just take away some guilt for a temporary period. It, it changes our world. And so what I want to do for the rest of, thank you for the three or four minutes on Rakur. Um, what I want to do the rest of this presentation is kind of walk through each one of those worlds with this communal life in mind, okay? So let's think about this defigured world. The defigured world that I want to, we could go here in all sorts of, hundred different directions, of course. The world's that messed up. Um, but for now, we'll stick with uh, Christianity for individuals, Okay. Now, I first actually got onto this at my first call up in Hugo. Um, now, I started out by saying, it's, I don't know if I said it, I was going to say it if I didn't, that I, I, I honestly believe New Life is the best congregation in Senate. Um, I, I mean, I've got experience with like four or five, so it's not a huge pool. Uh, but I love the people of New Life. I love the congregation. It's a wonderful place. Uh, but what was really interesting, when I got up there in 2007, it was maybe 2008 or 2009. I don't know if any of the, the, those that I saw today were, were there in the congregation. But we took a bus ride. Uh, well, it was a big van. A van ride down to, um, it might have been Mankato. The district was putting on an event. And it seemed like an event that it would be good for our congregation to go to. The, the topic seemed nice, and uh, the district was, was doing some good stuff. And so I, I recruited 10, what seemed to me, I was just, I'd been there for like a year and a half, 10 leaders of the congregation, uh, men, women, old and young, uh, all sorts of different people, and we got in this van and drove several hours to this event, and I was sitting in the, in the passenger, I was riding shotgun, uh, our DCO Faith was, I think, driving, and, and I was just listening to the conversation in the back of the van, and it was fascinating. I heard this kind of question. Where do you live? Do you have children? What do you do for a living? And I remember kind of being astounded there sitting in the front because I had been there for a year and a half and I'd tried to visit. I could have answered every question. And I'd only been there for a year and a half. And I thought to myself, self, um, these people don't know each other very well. Um, it actually led me to do a sermon series on ecclesiology, which was, well, it was a sermon series on ecclesiology. Um, I hope it helped a little bit. Uh, but it struck me in that van ride, this isn't a tight-knit group of people. I think they care about each other and they're committed to the church, but I don't think they know each other very well. Um, maybe you've seen that book, They Like Jesus But Not the Church. Uh, it's a little bit dated now, Dan Kimball, 2007. Kind of the idea that the people today, Jesus is kind of cool, uh, but don't bug me with the church because the church ain't kind of thing. Um, 
David Kinneman uh, did some really extensive study with Barna in 2011. The, the book, have you guys seen the book, You Lost Me? Anybody here? Um, some of you have come across that really insightful read. It interviews thousands of people who left the church. Why did, they, why did you leave the church, basically, is, was the whole point of the book. And, and a big piece of that is the church was not a place I could go when things were tough. The church is not a place I could go bring my doubts and my questions. The church is not a place where you can be real. Um, and so you have kind of a uh, notice when, 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 when the church would really should be the top of its game. And you guys all know this. You know this. You've been, in, maybe you're a pastor in a congregation, and, and the stuff hits the fan with a family, and they stop coming to church. Instead of that's the time when they need it the most. Um, a, a colleague of mine, one of my professors, Chuck Arend, wrote an article back in 2008, I think it was, um, and he called Lutherans ecclesiologically challenged. <laughs> that we get, the, we get the gospel for, for sinful individuals so clearly so well. Um, Reformation lecture, right? Um, but we don't always get the church, the church right. Um, but the one that really gets me, the one that really motivates me to think about this, is the retention crisis. And I use the word crisis, I should have made it five times as big font, that word, because that's where it is. I don't know if you've seen any statistics about retention in, in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Uh, Mark Kiesling, the director of youth ministry for our Synod, uh, did a, a study back in, what was this, 2015? Uh, and he tracked the numbers of baptisms and births and, and then some other stuff I'll show you in a minute uh, from 1950 to 2010, okay? And so you can see U.S. births have kind of stayed pretty steady. Uh, baptisms for, in our Missouri Synod were, were hit their peak in the 60s uh, and then kind of uh, have been a pretty slow decline since then every decade. Uh, if you're kind of a graph person, there's kind of a, uh, comparison. Of course, that has to do with uh, births have held steady with immigration, uh, and, and uh, we haven't kept pace with that. Uh, but what the real, the real stat I want to show you is this. Um, if you follow the, let's see if this little thing works, there you go. Uh, baptism is in 47, confirmations 13 years later, percentage of people that we baptized, we confirmed. So you got 92%, 91, 73, 89, 80, we're holding pretty steady, steady, uh, 62 starts to drop, 47%. 47% of the people we baptize, we confirm. What's really disturbing, well here I'll do that, um, is almost across the board, and this actually happened at New Life. I tracked it my first five or six years as a pastor. 67% of the kids we confirmed were gone from our churches by the end of high school. Okay, now I'm no mathematician, but just do a little dirty math with me here for a second. We'll, say, we'll be generous and say five out of 10 kids we baptize are confirmed, we lose two-thirds of them by the end of high school, which breaks down to about 1.6 kids we baptize out of 10 are in our church when they leave home. One year at New Life we had, um, I think one year we had 13 baptisms. I'll count off the first eight and say, we'll see you. Maybe two of you will stick around. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have family members who've had children among the eight. I don't think I need to. So this retention crisis is a real crisis. Now there's all sorts of factors for this. And, and there's, no, there's no one single thing. But, but my concern is that 
the communal part of the Christian life is not, is not something that young people are experiencing quite as much. Instead, they're experiencing what you might call a mirage. Charles Vogel is a, I don't know what he calls himself, he's like an, a writer, a speaker, uh, I saw him called one time a community strategist. Um, he's, uh, he doesn't work in the church, he works for companies like Google and Amazon and Airbnb. Um, he, he works on brand community for companies. Brand, you know, companies will try to say, you know, you come drink coffee at this place and you'll have a big, nice, happy family type of thing. Uh, and so trying to help companies have a good communal brand, he works with them. But he, he, he speaks about, he wrote a book called uh, The Art of Community. Um, and, and he's thinking about uh, what does genuine community actually look like? What does it entail? And he talks about what he says are mirage communities. And mirage communities are communities that may look like a community, and people who are part of them may think it's a community, and people who look in from the outside will say, oh, that looks like a community, that looks great. But it's not actually a community. Okay. And he said for, for genuine community to exist, you need three things. Okay. First of all, you need shared values. A, a, a genuine community, the peop, members will share important values. You also need to have shared practices that flow from those values. So you value the Reformation. So every year, you gather for the Reformation lecture. Shared value, shared practice. But those two alone are not genuine community. You need a third, which is mutual concern for one another's well-being. If you have the, well, all you really need to look like a community is the second one, right? Um, you know, take any community. You go to a, go to a, a, a Vikings game. Are the Vikings playing? Are they still around? Um, <laughs> seeing if they're still awake. Um, you know, people value, I don't know why, um, they value Viking football, and so they have a shared practice. They go to the game. But do they really care about each other? I mean, maybe when it's 40 below. Uh, but there's not necessarily a, a mutual, genuine concern for one another. You just happen to be in the same place at the same time because you like the same stuff, you value the same stuff, and so you come together to do the same stuff. Right? So the question is, what about our worship? <laughs> what about our congregations? Shared values... I don't know of anybody who comes to our churches, well, I'm sure there's a few wheat, tares among the wheat, or whatever. Um, people come because they value Jesus, faith in Jesus. They trust in Jesus, they come to worship. Um, shared practices, absolutely. We, we kind of do this, look at all those people, they're all doing the same thing. Um, genuine concern for one another. I'm not going to try to judge any of their hearts. I don't know if that guy knows that dude at all. Um, and so you, you can only tell by a picture. But the reason I share this, the reason I share this slide in this test case, worship as a test case, is I, I have no intention of saying anything at all about worship or worship style or liturgy or that kind of thing. That's not the point at all. The point is, um, I wonder how much engagement and community building there actually is among Christians who gather to worship every Sunday. So in one of my classes, I teach a class called Intro to Pastoral Ministry. We fixed it, Scott. It was a mess when you were there, but we've revised the class and it's a lot better now. Uh, the, uh, we were talking about community. We were talking about community in a congregation. And then we were specifically talking about worship and the building of community. And I, I asked the guys, this is a first year class, so they've been at the seminary, they've been at the seminary for like six weeks or something like that. And I asked them, how, how do you engage one another in chapel? 
what aspect of our worship uh, in chapel it helps you engage one another. And first, they didn't understand the question. <laughs> Maybe part of the problem. Um, and somebody said, well, the, the passing of the peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Okay. And somebody said, after chapel, coffee. Well, that doesn't count. That's coffee. I'm talking about when we're in the building. And one student thought about it. It was a very perceptive comment that he made. He said, we just kind of chewed on it for like 15 minutes in this class. It was really kind of fun. Uh, one student said, you know, I think when the organ stops playing for like the last stanza, we depend on each other to sing well, rather than depending on the instrumentation. And I thought, that's really interesting. And I've, I've been noticing that. So since then, I go to chapel, and I know I have half the stuff memorized anyhow, so I don't even have to look at it. Uh, most of us, though, are like this. I, I've decided to look around now in chapel. So I just look around while we're singing, while we're doing stuff. And you know what I see in our chapel? I see lots of heads down. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying anything about worship and, and styles and that kind of stuff. That you can look, put your head down on anything. Um, but uh, when, the, when the organ stops playing, we did this just during the Te Deum, the last two stanzas of it, uh, just yesterday in chapel. And you can hear the voices start to swell, and you start to listen to the voices. And you start to decide, well, if me, there's no decision because I can't sing harmony. Uh, but yet, some people have to decide, am I going to go harmony, or am I going to bass, or tenor, or alto? Um, and halfway through the stanza with no, with no organ, it becomes this communal event. I, I, I mean, maybe I'm just making something up, but to me it's a communal event where people are engaging one another without even looking at each other, but they're hearing each other's voices. And I thought, now that's, that's a little piece of engagement. That's, that's maybe something to to build on. Um, but my concern is, I've been, a, here's a dirty little secret. I don't think this is being streamed. Um, I didn't know who my elders were at my church. I've been there now for six years until a month or two ago. And I didn't even know one of their names. And I'm kind of a church work guy. I mean, think, think right now about your congregation. Now, see, what's hard, what's really hard is if you're a pastor or a DCE or a deaconess or a DCO, you're a little bit blind to this because you're in the middle of everything. You're like me in the passenger side of that van where I could answer all the questions. But if you're a normal person, you, you may not really know your brothers and sisters, <laughs> which when you put it like that, sounds really crazy. Uh, it's like we're family. So what are the causes of this defigured world? I better take my watch off, otherwise I'll tell stories all night. Uh, what are the causes? We could get kind of philosophical here, and I won't, but I'll fly through. Uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, Hobbes is the one who, uh, the political theorist, who said that voluntary consent is the key to social order. Voluntary consent. So social order depends on my consent. Uh, you know Rene Descartes, uh, I think therefore I am. Certainty about self, ultimate certainty, comes from the self. Uh, John Locke, uh, life, liberty, the, the pursuit of property. These are natural rights of whom? The individual. Okay. Now I'm not, I'm not attacking these things, I'm just pointing out where this came from. Okay, uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, his speech in 1928 that was called rugged individualism. I point these things out not to, to bash on this necessarily, although um, the individualism that, that is the air we breathe is air that has been ruminating for hundreds of years. Uh, we are incredibly individualist as a culture. We have to just recognize that. We, can't, we can try to undo it. Good luck. It's not going to happen. What we have to do is recognize that we live in an incredibly deeply seated individualistic context. 
And if you don't want to go into philosophy, then let's just go to some social things. Um, well, let me do this. Uh, so this is uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis. Uh, their International Student Handbook, this is 2018. I don't know how I came across this, but I do that kind of thing now. Um, so I came across this International Student Handbook, and, I, and look at what it says. The most important thing to understand about Americans is probably their devotion to individualism. Let me back it up. This is how UMSL helps visitors from other countries understand where they're going to live now. The most important thing to understand about Americans is probably their devotion to individualism. They have been trained since very early in their lives to consider themselves as separate individuals who are responsible for their own situations in life and their own destinies. They have not been trained to see themselves as members of a close-knit, tightly interdependent family, religious group, tribe, nation, or other collectivity. They've not been trained. They've not been catechized. Or, you weren't expecting this one, were you? So in, I was, this summer I was in Nebraska and I was speaking on this general topic and as we're driving to Concordia Seward, uh, one of my kids on one of their playlists, this, the song in the background, I can hear the tunes, I can buy myself flowers, write my name, I'm not gonna try to sing, uh, talk to myself for hours, say things you don't understand, I can take myself dancing, I can hold my own hand. Yes, I can love me better than you can. Now, of course, Miley Cyrus is probably singing about a deadbeat of a boyfriend. Okay. But who can say that? It, it, it doesn't even make sense. And, and so, so we've got this, this deep-seated, goes back hundreds of years, individualism. It shows up it, in, in Umzel's student handbook, and it shows up in the, the music that our kids are listening to, um, and some of you, although I won't ask you to raise your hand for that either. Um, so we could blame society, we could blame philosophy, but I'd rather get a little bit more personal and blame the church. Um, now, let me be clear here. What I mean by blame the church is point out some unintended consequences of some of the things we've done. Okay? You're familiar with the evangelism explosion? D. James Kennedy? Uh, do you remember the questions that are asked? How are you supposed to evangelize? There's two questions, and they're, well, I've got them written down here. Have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you can say for certain that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? And then, suppose that you were able to die, you'd die today and stand before God, and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Notice what kind of questions these are? Purely individualistic. Okay. So one of the ways we've gone about evangelism has been to zero in on the individual. Okay. Now again, I'm not saying there's not a place for individual faith. I'll address that a little bit more later. Uh, not at all. But just notice how we've set people up to think of their relationship with God purely in individualistic terms. What's your pronouns? I thought we'd go for something non-controversial here. Um, <laughs> no, for all, it kind of, it kind of makes me chuckle a little bit, except when it makes me cry. Uh, for all the talk about pronouns, the, the biggest travesty in the English language in terms of pronouns is which one? It's the second person pronoun. It's you for singular, and it's you for plural, right? And so I can look at it and say, how is your day, and how do you hear that? You're all thinking, what did I do today? Oh, you bunch of individualistic. I was acting, I was asking about the day of Minnesota. How was Minnesota's day today? Your day. But see, this is another way in which church workers, especially preachers here, I think, are a little bit, uh, uh, maybe a little bit um, caught off guard. Because right now, I'm looking at a collective. And when I say you, half the time, more than half the time, I'm having in mind the you plural. When you hear you, what are you looking at right now? You're looking at one person as one person. Now, this really caught me when I went to St. Louis after being at New Life, because I, I would preach at New Life, and I would, I would say you all the time, and I was meaning y'all. I, I, the Texans at the seminary really have a field day with this. Um, it's really annoying. Um, I would say y'all, but when I got to St. Louis, and I was no longer the preacher, 
and I was now one sitting in the pews. This stood out to me most on um, Christmas Eve uh, with the whole candlelight thing, because that was one of my favorite things at New Life. You know, you light the candles, and all these people look like cherubs for just a moment, where they're holding the holding the, the candle, and there's the glow and everything, and I'd always, I don't know if you remember Penny, but I would say, why don't you guys look at each other? This is such a wonderful view. You can see the saints of God. Um, but then I get to Messiah down in St. Louis, and I'm just trying not to let my kid light the lady's hair on in front of, in front of her, and you know, you've got wax dripping everywhere, and you can see the backs of the heads, and you don't see anybody. And so you've got a whole different, well, you've got a whole different view from the pew. Um, and, and so again, this is nothing this is not intentional by any means, uh, but a, a, an effect of our life together sometimes, you guys have been there, you've been in church, and it's been a very isolating experience. Um, I'll, I'll go quickly through this. Uh, sometimes the gospel metaphors we use are very individualistic. Uh, the acquittal courtroom metaphor, individuals are acquitted. The adoption metaphor is much more communal. There's a lot of different metaphors we could use to describe the gospel, and uh, this book by Jack Preuss, Just Words, unpacks a lot of metaphors, and, and, and uh, we kind of gravitate in our tradition toward individualistic gospel metaphors that we should uh, be aware of. And then finally, sacramental individuals, and this is one I want to dwell on just a little bit longer. Um, usually when we talk about the sacraments, we talk about God coming down to whom? Oftentimes, say, well, I'll say for you, central to the gospel. And you'll hear that as for me. Um, and so just, just think about the things we emphasize when we emphasize the sacraments. We emphasize baptism, I'm forgiven, I'm saved. We don't necessarily do what Paul did in Romans 6, I'm baptized, therefore, love one another. <laughs> Walk in newness of life together. Uh, or, or 1 Corinthians uh, 12, you are baptized into each other. Um, talk about, well, we'll get to the Lord's Supper in just a minute, uh, but w- the way in which we emphasize even the wonderful gifts of God as very personal, it's got your name on it. Uh, again, that's true, and that's an important piece of the gospel, but that neglects the other part. Um, so, oh, notice, so this is defigured world, now we're going to the configured world, and I'll move quicker through this. Um, I think we've kind of gotten an assist from the social sciences here. I think we can appreciate that. Um, Harvard uh, Magazine wrote an article called The Other Pandemic, or it was actually called The Loneliness Pandemic. Em- empirical research has for some time indicated the powerful effects that relationships, social support, community participation have on health and well-being. As Aristotle observed, we are political animals able to fully flourish only in community. When we are deeply embedded in relationships, we tend to thrive. When we're isolated, the cost to our well-being is considerable. This is just social science. And we're, it's not the gospel. It's not good news. But it's kind of, I would call, an assist. Kind of, in, in this respect, the, the pandemic showed us something, I think. Showed us the importance of community. Um, and, and maybe exposed ways in which, you know, interestingly, my congregation in St. Louis, we, I got to know people better during the pandemic because our pastor had asked members of the congregation to write, uh, to video themselves, two-minute reflections on, we were all doing some sort of reading plan, and the, the text that we'd read, and what it meant in our lives, and then uh, close with a prayer. Very simple, a two-minute thing. There were kids that were four years old, did them, older people, people I'd never even met that were members of the congregation, I got to know. <laughs> Crazy. Have you heard of the social frailty index? This is from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the idea here is that um, researchers found the index helped predict an increased risk of death during the period studied in a significant number of older adults. Uh, social frailty index measures how robust your community is. And now it's this index that social, the, uh, the uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences is using. Okay, now this is just an assist. This helps expose kind of God made us to be communal creatures, uh, but it's not yet It's not yet gospel because here's what happens. Community outside the church, you know what community outside the church is like? It can be wonderful. It can be great. It can be really helpful, but it is self-selected. You choose to join the gym. And then at the gym, you might find some community. Great. But if you don't choose to join them, there's no community there. It's also temporary. As long as 
uh, soccer season was going. I was on the sidelines with my boys, friends, dads, and we were yucking it up. And the season ended. I haven't seen him since. Temporary. And it's tribalistic. Which is to say, we requires a them. This tribe, not that tribe. It's closed off. It's not open. Uh, and it's even in competition. The polarization of our culture here is kind of part of this. Um, so this is the kind of community. So the assist from the social sciences can only expose, further expose the problem. It can't, it can't help us. Even though sometimes community outside the church can be a great, a great blessing. But it's, it's going to be limited. And it's certainly not gospel. So the configured world, this was kind of toward the configured world. Now the configured world, what is the Christian life actually like? And I won't go as deep here as I could, uh, but uh, I want to start with who is God. Uh, John Zizioulis wrote a book called uh, Being as Communion Studies and Personhood in the Church. And what he does is he unpacks human being in relation to God's being. And God's being is triune, relational. For all eternity, there is relationships. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Trinity is true being. The fall, according to Zeus, is a loss of human being, which is communal. And then salvation is restored human communal being. Now, of course, I would never limit the fall and salvation to these terms. This is just kind of an, an aspect of it. Of course, there's individual culpability, individual redemption, salvation. But this kind of way of thinking, is, it, it, it kind of, it's, it's added to, uh, it's, it's, it's more than just individual, it's also communal. He used to be here for a while. Um, I, I, he just doesn't age, that's the weird thing. Uh, and, and he pops up out of nowhere. He'll be gone for six months and around the world, and then there he is, hey, Bob. Uh, I get to call him Bob now. That's one of the cool privileges. Um, he likes to talk about God as a God of conversation and community. I really like that. Conversation, word, and community. Because actually you can't have conversation without community. Uh, you can try to hold your own hand. And you can take yourself dancing. But you can't have a conversation. Okay. Now Bob just gets this from the Bible. Um, it's not, he used to always make this Freudian slip, that, which wasn't a Freudian slip, but I loved it in class. He'd say, we're just trying to be uh, Lutheran, I mean biblical, I mean a Lutheran, I mean biblical. Um, you get it. Father of the fatherless, God settles the solitary in a home. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. That verse 9 those of you who are preachers know what I'm talking about here. When you have members of your congregation who have trouble having children, to help them see these are your children. These are your grandparents. We are family. I had to tell people at New Life this all the time, you have to help me discipline my kids <laughs> because I'm busy doing something else on Sundays. So treat them like they're yours. You read from John earlier that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me. And just as the Trinity is one, Jesus prays that we would be one. Not just that we would be forgiven and guiltless and redeemed, yes, but we would be one in our redemption and our forgiveness. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, baptized into one body. Again, how do we talk about baptism? We talk about baptism by talking about community. It should be part of the conversation, at least. Once you were a people, but now you, you, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And so we've got outside the church, self-selected, temporary, tribalistic. What about inside the church? Well, it's chosen by God. This is Reformation 101, right? Uh, salvation by grace through faith, alone, in Christ, alone. Eternal. Uh, there's no end. We better get used to it. You may not like me, I may not like you. But we're in this for the long haul, so better get used to it. Hospitable. 
instead of tribalistic. Now I want to get to Luther, and I'm going to go just a little bit longer than eight so we get enough Luther in here to check the Reformation box. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, I think you'll find this next part interesting. My hunch is you haven't seen it. Luther wrote in 1519 a treatise called The Blessed Sacrament of the Holy and True Body of Christ and the Brotherhoods. Okay, it's a very interesting read. Um, in this, so Luther wrote a lot on the sacrament, the Lord's Supper, and so usually this is not the first thing people read, partially because it's early Luther, it's 1519, um, and so it doesn't get a lot of play. He wrote several things about the Lord's Supper in the late 1520s and even after that uh, that get much more attention. But what's interesting about this is it's a, uh, he, he, he does three things. He talks about what is the sacrament, he calls it a sign. Um, the second one, the, the significance um, the effect. What is the effect of the Lord's Supper? And he spends almost the entire treatise on the effect. What is the effect of baptism, or of Lord's Supper? And then he spends a little bit of time on the faith required of the first two. And so what, what Luther's trying to help us see in this treatise is he's trying to take this man at the table, now we're talking about a different table, And, and bring the rest in view. Because the thing he hits over and over and over again in that 1519 treatise is the effect on the community. He says very little about the effect on the individual. Except to say that the individual now is part of the community. Okay, so I'm going to share a couple things here uh, with this. The significance or effect of the sacrament is the fellowship, these are all Luther quotes now, uh, is the fellowship of all the saints. That's the effect. That's the significance. That's what happens to the Lord's Supper, is fellowship. This fellowship consists in this, that all spiritual possessions of Christ and his saints are shared with and become the common property of him who receives this sacrament. Again, all sufferings and sins also become common property. And thus love engenders in return, and mutual love unites. So not, notice he's saying spiritual possessions. This is not yet, at least, um, material possessions. But spiritual possessions, sufferings, and sin. We share them. That's an effect of communing together. You share each other's sufferings. You share each other's sins. You also share each other's spiritual possessions, the, the blessings of Christ. We share forgiveness. We share life. We share salvation. And a big piece of this treatise is bearing the misfortunes of others. When you have partaken of this sacrament, therefore, or desire to partake of it, you must in turn share the misfortunes of the fellowship. Now, how are you going to share the misfortunes of people in your fellowship if you don't know them? I will make your suffering and misfortune my own and will be it for you, so that you in your turn may do the same for me and for one another. It, it's funny, those of you who, who distribute the Lord's Supper on Sunday mornings, you, you know what this is like. Um, people come to the Lord's table, and it's always, it was always interesting to me as a pastor to watch their eyes. <laughs> you guys didn't know I was doing this. Uh, although I, I guess you were looking at me if you did. Um, some people come to the Lord's Supper, and they are looking down. Reverence, humility, repentance, that's appropriate. Uh, some people were looking up at the cross. Eyes were fixed there. Um, one guy, I won't share his name, would do it like this. <laughs> but you know what most people weren't looking at? Each other. Hey, hey, good to see you here. It's, at least it wasn't the part of the piety of our congregation. Maybe your congregation is different. Uh, but I will make your suffering my own. We're communing together. I'm making your suffering my suffering. And I need you to make my suffering. That's the hard part, right? To ask someone else. I need you to suffer with me. On the frequency of the Lord's Supper in this treatise, 
It is the Christ's will, then, that we partake of it frequently. This is where he contrasts it with baptism. He says, baptism is once because it's new life. The Lord's Supper is frequent. Why is it frequent? In order that we may remember him and exercise ourselves in this fellowship, according to his example. And his example here is the example of self-sacrifice for others. And so why should you commune regularly so that you get more forgiveness? That sounds a little selfish. Commune frequently to grow in the fellowship and to depend on the fellowship and to serve the fellowship. The early church, so Luther then points to the early church as here's the example. But in times past, the sacrament was so properly used and the people were taught to understand this fellowship so well that they even gathered food and material goods in the church and there, as St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, distributed among those who were in need. Christians cared for one another, supported one another, sympathized with one another, bore one another's burdens and affliction. Of course, he's looking back to the early church. They had everything in common. Um, This does justice to the sacrament, Luther says. For the sacrament has no blessings unless love grows daily and so changes a person that he is made one with all others. That is real fellowship, and that is the true significance of the sacrament. In this way, we are changed into one another and are made into a community by love. Without love, there can be no change. He even goes so far, and I won't go down this rabbit hole, but I find it fascinating. Remember, this is early Luther, 1519, okay? Um, Christ values his spiritual body, which is the fellowship of his saints, more than his own natural body. To him, it is more important, especially in the sacrament, that faith in the fellowship with him and with his saints may be properly exercised and become strong in us. Now, let me just say just a little bit of context. In 1519, Luther was really at, up, upset with uh, Rome. He was writing against Rome, and especially transubstantiation and the substance accident stuff that's tra- really worried about the, the, the body and, and, and what kind of this thing. He wasn't yet dealing with the radical reformers who were rejecting real presence, okay? And so he didn't need to argue for that. Um, But what's really interesting about this is, uh, well, that's just a summary of it. What's really interesting is Paul Althaus uh, in his Theology of Martin Luther, kind of a a pretty substantial summary of Luther's theology. It's a little bit longer quote, but stick with me on this. The Lord's Supper as the sacrament of of the communion of saints later receded into the background of Luther's thought, and he is primarily interested in the real presence and the reception of the heavenly body and blood of Christ. It is significant that they cease, that is his emphasis on thinking about the fellowship, they cease at the very point at which the battle for the real presence begins. And this is Aldhouse's estimation here. There can be no question that this development restricted and impoverished the doctrine of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. As celebrated in our church, it is certainly the high point of the individual Christian life, but it is not equally the center of the community's life of sharing the body of Christ. We today must once again take up his thoughts. Now, whether or not this is a judgment that Althaus makes, later on he says that Luther's moving a little bit away from the fellowship part as a result, he said that greatly impoverished his doctrine of the Lord's Supper. And I, I think, uh, you know, that's a, that's a judgment that Althaus makes. Um, but what I want to point out is it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's not either God is coming to us and giving us forgiveness and strength in his body and blood, or he's making us into a community. Um, but there's room for both. And maybe in the hundreds of years of individualism that we find ourselves in right now, maybe this is an accent that could be elevated a little bit. Not to the diminution of trust in the real presence, confidence in individual salvation, but met on that level, maybe. At least that direction. Okay, I want to say just a little bit about the mutual conversation and consolation of brothers and sisters, uh, but I'll make it quick. In the small called articles, 
part of the Book of Concord. Uh, section 3, um, paragraph 4. Luther, this is Luther's kind of last will and testament. So that was early Luther, 1519, 1537, small called articles, where Luther talks about the, the, extravagant, the scra- extravagant generosity of God's grace. And he says God gives us grace in five different ways. Uh, through the spoken word, that's preaching, through baptism, through the sacrament of the altar, the power of the keys, those four get lots of play in our circles. What often gets left out is the mutual conversation and consolation of brothers and sisters. And I know it gets left out because I grade first-year sermons. <laughs> and it's really interesting when I grade sermons. When, when the first-year seminarian feels the need to make sure he's Lutheran, uh, at the very end of the sermon, he'll say, Baptism and the Lord's Supper and absolution. <laughs> Maybe preaching. Uh, and usually my note in the margin is, if you're going to rattle off small cut articles, finish the job. <laughs> Not sure homiletically if that's the best move, but okay. But that's something that we don't talk much about. But listen to Luther here. Oh, that's the same, same point. Um, All who are Christians and have been baptized have this power to forgive one another's sins. For with this they praise Christ, and the word is put into their mouth, so that they may and are able to say, if they wish, and as often as is necessary, look, God offers you his grace, forgives you all his sins, be comforted, your sins are forgiven, only believe and you will surely have forgiveness. This word of consolation shall not cease among Christians until the last day. Such language a Christian always uses and openly declares the forgiveness of sins. For this reason and in this manner a Christian has power to forgive sins. Large catechism. By divine ordinance, Christ has placed, Christ himself has placed absolution in the mouths of his Christian community and command us to absolve one another. This is a long one, but I'll just jump you down here. Um, he pours out his forgiveness even more richly and places the forgiveness of sins for them in every corner, so they do not only find the forgiveness of sins in the congregation, but also at home, in their houses, in the fields and gardens, wherever one of them comes to another in search of comfort and deliverance. It shall be at my disposal when I am troubled and sorry and tribulation and vulnerable, when I need something, whatever hour and time it may be. There's not always a sermon being given publicly in the church. So when my brother or neighbor comes to me, I am to lay my troubles before my neighbor and ask for comfort. A community who forgives, repents. The, the, the forgiveness and the repentance and the absolution in the worship service is, is wonderful. It's a great gift and it's important and we should do it all the time. But if, if we're not sending people to be forgiving people, Sharing the mutual conversation, not just the words of forgiveness, but the words of God's commands, holding each other accountable. I want you to just imagine, as we're thinking about this, and we're getting close to the end here now, I want you to just imagine, imagine a congregation that, that bears one another's misfortunes when they commune together, that consoles one another with forgiveness, that, that shares openly and honestly and doesn't just do the church fine thing. Uh, you know the church fine? How's it going? Fine. Most of the time it's not. But at church, what are you going to say? You're going to be honest? <laughs> oh. Maybe, maybe, yeah, we should. Um, imagine that kind of congregation. Now we're starting to think about a congregation not just a bunch of people who are, happen to share the same values and happen to share the same practices. Now, there's a genuine care and concern for one another. That was one of the, I, it took me five or, four or five years probably at New Life to learn this. I, I went through a number of new member classes and I loved teaching new member classes because I got to know the new members really well. And then I would pay attention to what would happen the next two, three, six, ten, twelve weeks. And some of the members of my new classes, new member classes, only knew me. <laughs> now, new life was actually kind of unique, uh, and that new life really envelops people uh, in, in a way that, that isn't always the case. Um, but this, this, this is actually something we can work on. Um, 
So what I'm encouraging in this refigured world, again, recur, the prefigured world is individualistic. The configured world is the Christian life is a communal life. That's the biblical message. I didn't even get into how many pronouns in the epistles are plural. Second person plural. They're almost, not all, but predominantly, a lot of the ones we read as individual are plural pronouns in the New Testament. Uh, the configured world is a communal life. The refigured world is life in the Christian community. And I'm talking about a communal life. I'm talking about a congregation that's not just where you show up on Sunday mornings, but a place where you bear the misfortunes of your brothers and sisters. And, and you, you open yourself up and you are willing to receive from others. We could have done a similar drill with baptism, the Ten Commandments. Chuck Aaron was telling me a little while ago that Luther's conception of the Ten Commandments in a number of places is really clear. He doesn't look at them, Luther did not look at the Ten Commandments so much as a moral code, do this, do that, do this, do that, as an individual, as much as he kind of talked about it as a hedge around the community. The Ten Commandments as a hedge around the community to keep us a community. That's why we respect authorities. That's why we uh, cherish our husbands and wives, to put a hedge around the community. It's a more communal than just an individual, do this, don't do that. So here's my suggestions. We expand the perspective. Um, we give people a view from the front. Uh, we mind our pronouns, uh, and maybe even learn a little bit from those Texans. Uh, don't fake it though, that's no, that's no good. Um, but be intentional. When I say you, I mean you all. And maybe every once in a while, look at each other. I did that one time. Do you guys remember that at New Life? I did that where we were doing the absolution. I had everybody look at it. Or I, I don't remember what we were doing, but it was really awkward. <laughs> Should have done it more. Uh, prioritize communion of gospels, ecclesiological intentionality, Sunday as relationship day. Okay, let me just say one word about this. So in Germany, uh, in Germany it's still the case that uh, Sundays are basically everything's closed on Sundays, and they call it Ruetag, rest day. Uh, and it's really, for one who comes from a 24-hour, seven culture, it was just a delight to not have to think about not going shopping, even if you forgot, forgot something on Sunday. I loved it. Um, but there's a podcast I listened to of a couple of young Germans from Berlin just to kind of keep the language up. And I love it because they're not Christians. One of them was originally some sort of Polish Catholic. The other one's not connected at all. And just hearing what they talk about. And they had one episode on Ruetag. Uh, and one of the guys, the young guy who's not connected to the church at all, he said, I like to call that day. And he actually, he was all in German, but he said for in, in English, he said, that's relationship day. Because on, and then he went back to German, on, on on Sundays, he, he tends to his relationships. He's too busy working during the week, taking care of his business. Sunday is relationship day. And I thought to myself, bingo. Bingo. Relationship day. 